just going to hit the record button. Thank you. Let's All right. Rolling. I will I will just jump into the to the intro. If people come in a few minutes late, they're not going to miss any of the content that they're here for. So that's OK. So welcome. Uh, thanks for coming along to our session today about the Web Sustainability Guidelines. Um, why are we here? What are we talking about? Uh, how does Google Slides work? These are all important questions. Um, so now more than ever, many, many UX designers are finding uh, their way into uh, the intersection of sustainability, web, and UX. Uh, 10 years ago or so, not so much. We didn't see that many people talking about these topics. Uh, but now, these are just what I found in about five minutes. There are an embarrassingly large number of places for a, a newly um, uh, activated uh, climate-saving UX designer to start. Uh, if you just take Google as your starting point, there's a, there's a plethora. There's at least five books that I'm aware of, uh, one of which is by one of our panelists today. So obviously that's the best book on the list here. <laughs> um, but there's a million blog posts. There's at least half a dozen manifestos, foundations, all kinds of things. It's a confusing time uh, to start getting into this field. Where are you meant to start? Um, and while all these uh, uh, articles and books share a lot of content, there's a lot of overlap, um, they, they've all come out at different times. It's an evolving field. There isn't a single source of truth for people to go to. Um, but that is starting to change. And that's why we're here today. So just a couple, can't believe it's just been a couple of months. A couple of months ago, uh, the um, W3C Sustainable Web Design Group hit publish on the first draft or the first formal version 1.0 of the Web Sustainability Guidelines. Um, and this is like the first really serious attempt to pull together all the disparate strands of thought going on in and around this topic into one, one set of guidelines that can be updated that are, that are controlled by the community in an open process um, and that are ultimately, hopefully, going to be the source of truth that uh, we can all refer to going forward. Um, so to help us navigate this, uh, this new world of standards-based sustainability, uh, I've invited along uh, a few experts. Um, so first of all, hang on, let me switch my screen there. Uh, first, but definitely not least, we have Tim Frick. Uh, Tim is the founder and president of Mighty Bytes, a digital agency and certified B Corp in Chicago. He's a speaker, community organizer, and author of four books, including Designing for Sustainability from O'Reilly. He's also spoken twice at Sustainable UX conferences in 2016 and 2017. Next, Anne Fowbry. Anne is an independent UX UI designer working on digital services with an emphasis on frugality, eco-design, inclusion, and accessibility. Anne's portfolio includes work for NGOs, public services, and small businesses. She co-authored the Intro Guide to Digital Eco-Design as part of Designers Ethics. Anne is also a con contributor to the French standard AFNOR and has served as the committee co-chair for the UX chapter of the W3C Sustainable Web Design Guidelines. And Anne's co-chair is here as well, Thorsten Jonas. Thorsten is a sustainable product UX and innovation consultant, keynote speaker, and founder of the SUX Sustainable UX Network. He guides teams and companies in crafting sustainable, responsible, and ethical products. Uh, he's also, well, as I mentioned, the co-chair of the UX chapter of uh, Web Design Guidelines and a co-host of the SUX podcast, where he interviews thought leaders from around the globe and shares insights and strategies for integrating sustainability into the product design process. So I'm going to hand over straight to, to the experts here. Um, we will be running a Q&A at the end of this session. So do use the question button at the bottom of um, Zoom here. I'll be collecting those. And hopefully, we'll have a, a reasonable amount of time at the end to get into those questions. Take it away. I need to stop sharing, though, don't I? There we go. OK. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking over. and. Let me see how quick I can bring my screen up. So you should see my screen now. Oh, I can see it. I see some nodding. Wonderful. Um, yeah, at first, James, thank you so much for, for inviting us and for this to, to speak about this important topic. And thank you all out there for joining the session here to hear about the web sustainability guidelines. And 
about what it is and well why we need it and how you could use it in UX and and design and I want to start our little pre presentation here with uh, three more pictures of the three of us and as you can see all of us we are really connected to nature I would say we are we are, we love being outside doing hiking um, cycling mountaineering and it is beautiful doing these things but it's for all of us always also a reminder of well how drastic the situation is we are in right so i do a lot of mountaineering and hiking in the mountains and whenever i go there and i see how fast the glaciers are vanishing year by year that's really alerting actually right and and it's much more drastic than we feel in our cities i would i would say so it's always a very good reminder um to go back to nature to get reminded of why we need to do these things so still why do we need sustainability guidelines for the web and second question what has ux to do with it right and as i guess most of you are somehow related to ux and design um as i am for for a long time now you all might know these or similar um, definitions of ux and i show this here because you know, for me, for a very long time, I always thought we we are the good people, right? We do the good things. We we fight for our users. We fight against the evil marketing or the evil business people or whatever. We we are the good people. We do the good things. But one question that we need to ask ourselves actually is, well, does what we create justify what we destroy? And this, this quote by Tony Fry, it's, it's a reminder for me I read it again and again, because this is, I think, really important to ask ourselves this question. And what do I mean with that real quick? And maybe most of you already know these or similar numbers. Well, the internet, all the stuff that we build relates somehow on the internet. And you might know these numbers, right? It's It uses a lot of energy and it, by this emits a lot of uh, greenhouse emissions. And well, you could say 4% of the global greenhouse emissions, hmm, whatever does this mean? Well, if we break this down to one website and here is one example this is actually uh, I have been at the Danish tax administration at the beginning of this year and this is their website where people go and do their tax stuff actually so they have roughly 2.5 million visits per month and this easily emits 20 tons of CO2 each month only on the client side actually not on, not on the service side and that's, well, 20 tons of CO2 per month for one website. We all know how many websites with how many millions and millions and millions of users we have. I think that shows the potential that we that we see there. And another interesting thing, and maybe many of you have heard this before as well, most of the emissions of a product, and that's not only digital products, that's all kinds of products, are set in the design phase. And design phase means also the engineering, so it's not, it's not all our fault as, as digital designers. Um, still, I think it's th there lies a huge responsibility, and also uh, huge opportunities to to be to be of impact actually. But when we talk about sustainability, it's also important not only to talk about carbon emissions because we have this effect which is called the carbon tunnel vision. We talk so much about carbon emissions that we very often forget about all the other aspects we have there that are also about sustainability. And one example is um, freshwater usage of the data centers that host all the wonderful websites and digital applications that we that we run. And here is a number I just read that um, the other day. So it says, well, by 2030, the data centers and the water that they use will top roughly 1.7 billion liters, which is 450 million gallons daily actually and well what could that mean another great number from these um from this article is that by 2030 each one of us might have a digital doppelganger with our well where, which means our internet consuming uses the same amount of water that we need for our personal personal life right and this is wow this is huge right and the interesting thing is most most of these stuff relates from well, from data that is not really useful, that we do not really use, that is just stored and that is usually just junk. And um, another example, since, well, I guess many of you are from 
from uh, from the US or from from, from Northern America. Um, here's another interesting number I read about. Um, uh, that's an example from a city called the Dallas, which is in Oregon. And I wanted to bring an example here from uh, from the US. So freshwater usage of data centers is not not a thing of uh, some other countries somewhere else in the world. It's a thing for us in our in our countries. And so they, there is a data center um, by by Google, and they use well almost twenty five percent of the town's uh, water supply is used by this data center, and this is a huge problem actually, especially when you look in, in other regions, also in the U.S., where you have a problem with water scarcity, right? So that's that's the problem that we have here. And there is one more aspect I want to real quick talk about. We all might know things like. We have Uber Eats, we here in Europe, we have some other services which do the similar thing. I think you could say they are a good example for good UX and for user convenience, right? So it's super convenient for me to order something. The apps are mostly pretty well built. So it's super convenient to order something. And then 15 minutes later, someone shows up at my door and I just have to get up from my couch to the door and, and pick up my pick up my stuff. But What's the downside of this? Well, these platforms are really good in undermining workers' rights. And right, so here in Europe, it's it's the same as it is in the US. Most of the people are not even employed, but they are so-called self-employed, right? And so they are not paid really well. Or um, also the restaurants that that uh, work together with them, they, it's not so good for them as well because these platforms take a really high commission. And if you talk to restaurants, you will hear that it's really hard for them to operate profitable because of these high commissions. And I show you this because I think this is a big problem that we have, especially with UX, because we focus so much on our user that we forget about all the other things that happen around our users. Because too often someone or something else pays the price for the good user experience that we build for our users and that we that we uh, create with focusing on our users. And here's a nice quote from a guy, Kevin Slevin, which is also some kind of a mantra for me. I heard him many, many years ago at a wonderful conference in Malmö in Sweden. And he said, when designers center around the user, where do the needs and desires of the other actors in the system go? The lens of the user obscures the view of the ecosystems it affects. Right? And this, this is the big, big problem that we have. We, we focus so much on users and try to make things great for users and we fight for the users, but everything that we build is part of a bigger system. And we need to get from this super user-focused approach to a much more systemic approach. And we need to understand about the impacts that the stuff that we build has on all these other things. And so actually we need from what we call human-centered design to something that is rather humanity and also environmental centered design. And by doing this and um, coming to an end with this, with this intro, it's, as I said, important to design for all aspects of sustainability. Carbon impacts are super important and maybe su uh, it's super urgent to, to work on this, but we must not forget about the other aspects. And I guess most of you have heard about the sustainable development goals, but they are a very good basis. And all of them relate more or less to our work as um, as digital people, as UX designers. And uh, yeah, I can highly recommend to have a look into these as well. And so that was a real quick intro. And with this, I will head over to Tim to talk a little bit about the guidelines itself and how they how this whole project started. And Great. Thanks here so you much, go, Tim. Justin. Thank you. Can you all can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm just going to, um, thanks for that great intro, because that really does set a good context. I know we're going to be spoke, speaking a little bit more about the details and the nuances, but I want to give a general overview of the web sustainability guidelines. We we put these together over the course of the past couple of years, specifically to address some of the things that Thorsten brought up in his introduction. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about it and, and about the, you know, kind of the premise of it and the, the background a little bit. Um, the World Wide Web Consortium, also known as the web, uh, W3C, creates web standards. They're best known for their work in web accessibility through the Web Accessibility Initiative, as well as the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. 
Um, we were definitely inspired by that work um, that they have been around for 20 plus years now at this point. Um, and so when we were working at web sustainability guidelines, we were looking at uh, what WCAG and, and saying, hey, that would be a really good model to follow as we were kind of you know thinking about what kind of sustainability guidelines should we create for the web uh, as, as, as James brought up when, in his intro of the fact that there's information all over the place, but none of it has really been collected and put in one single set of, of guidelines. So our group is a community group. It's not affiliated um, uh, as, as members of the W3C, but we are a community group. There's uh, hundreds of community groups within the W3C ecosystem. We started it in 2013 as a place to share resources and simulate discussion around the, the what was then a very nascent topic of digital sustainability. Um, here, I'll actually... Uh, uh, drop a, a link in the chat quick, like anybody can join um, the, the community group at that link. And so we began the work on the web sustainability guidelines in earnest um, in 2021, um, mainly because we saw a big shift uh, once the pandemic hit, we were seeing a lot more awareness of, of digital sustainability and, and interest in, in kind of understanding the, the, the impact of our, our work on the internet. So we released uh, version one in September of this year, uh, as, as James mentioned earlier. Um, our group has currently 146 members and we're growing. Hopefully some of the people on this, uh, on this call, if you're not a member, please consider becoming one. Um, there were 80 contributors to the, to the guidelines uh, from 14 different company, or countries. Um, and those included web developers, UX designers, environmentalists, sustainability experts, academics, business and tech leaders, et cetera. Um, we just re released draft three of the guidelines. So we've had three drafts since September um, and we're currently working on draft four as well as a working group uh, charter to become on the standards or recommendations track within the W3 ecosystem. So that was a lot of backstory. Um, I'll just quickly go through and and as, as Dorsen mentioned, we do focus on environmental, social and governance. Um, so we really have a kind of triple bottom line approach to what we're looking at. We are looking at social issues alongside carbon, uh, as well as economic issues. And so the guidelines really are meant to focus on a bunch of different players within this ecosystem. Um, so they're not really specifically focused at UX designers or, or, or web developers or whatever. They're really in the digital product ecosystem. Um, but today's topic and, and what we're gonna cover is, is digging deep into the, um, into the uh, UX design guidelines. So uh, the, there are three main goals to make it easier for to apply sustainability principles to the to digital products and services that you manage um, and measurably improve the internet's environmental, social, and economic impact, as well as align these efforts with existing uh, ESG standards like uh, GRI. We did align all of our work to the Global Reporting Initiative, which is an open standard. It's in readiness for coming EU legislation as well as legislation in the United States. Um, and so we're, we're kind of trying to include that so that when organizations are doing their, their environmental impact of reporting or their ESG reporting, that they can start to include digital products and services as part of that. Um, so uh, as at a glance, there are 93 different guidelines. It's actually much larger than the web content accessibility guidelines, um, of which uh, there are 236 different success criteria underneath those 93 guidelines. And it's a single document. If you look at it as a single document, it's about 300 pages or so. So you might want to get a cup of coffee or two if you decide you want to actually sit through and read them all. Um, there are also five categories, and I'm going to quickly whiz through these. I'll, I'll, I'll really only mention the fact that the UX design category Anne and Dorsten are going to cover in detail. But we have hosting, business and product strategy, UX design, web development, and metrics um, as part of these five categories. So business and product strategy is 28 guidelines aimed at organizational and team leaders to help them make more informed strategic and operational decisions. Um, if you've worked in digital products and services, you've seen, you know, that like one part of the ecosystem may be really focused on, on you know, one set of metrics, whereas, you know, perhaps business and product leaders are, are form formed on another one web developers on another one. And so the idea is here to, to uh, create 28 guidelines for business leaders and product team leaders so that they can you know, actually make more informed decisions around sustainability. The UX design uh, guidelines, there's 29 of them. I'll let Torsten and, and Ann cover that. Um, there's 24 different web development guidelines. They're meant to help programming teams improve performance and reduce data payloads, as well as lower digital emissions. 
and uh, hosting and infrastructure. We have 12 guidelines under that. There's meant to help teams make more informed decisions about things like third party technology suppliers, green hosting, uh, you know, practices on the back end, et cetera. And then finally, we had a metrics. Each each one of these these categories had their uh, uh, co-chairs essentially, and Torsten and Ann were for the UX design. Um, and then we also had a metrics uh, metrics committee that looked at all of them and said, how do we create measurement metrics for these things? And so GRI was one of the efforts, but really we we looked at all of these metrics to uh, and, and and apply some some measurement uh, KPIs across all of them so that we can help organizations more easily incorporate digital sustainability initiatives into their you know, existing reporting standards, as I mentioned. In terms of what we need to reach our goals, we did just release these in September. Um, there's four main things on the education side. We really need curriculum, we need training, we need certifications, we need research done, more research done. On the tooling side, we need software resources to advance digital sustainability. My company created something called EcoGrader. There's also website carbon out there. There's a bunch, a bunch of different, you know, uh, carbon emissions website carbon emissions uh, tools that are out there. But we need these principles baked into all the tools that digital products and service teams use. Um, and so tooling is a really important part of what we're doing. And we're working with the W3C uh, in, in detail on that because they have a lot of experience in that area. Adoption, we need outreach, we need community and awareness building, we need feedback from the community on how to improve these guidelines, et cetera. Um, um, so there's a huge lift there. Um, and then of course we need legislation. We need meaningful reg regulations to support digital sustainability on carbon, carbon estimations alone. There are huge data gaps in some of the models that are out there. Um, and so any of the estimations that you use in a tool like EcoGrader or Website Carbon aren't really giving you the full picture. And so we need legislation to, you know, have carbon disclosures uh, like, like CSRD in the, um, in the EU um, and similar things so that we have access to information and data that we need. Um, and finally, on my last slide, you can find all of this at sustainablewebdesign.org. Um, uh, Alex Dawson, my co-chair of the W3C community group, actually uh, um, created a JSON file that that a lot, anybody can use to incorporate the web sustainability guidelines into their own products and services. We implemented them at sustainablewebdesign.org. It's synced to the master uh, um, uh, guidelines. And so every time those change, when we go from draft three to draft four, it'll be relatively easy to update sustainablewebdesign.org. The difference I think with sustainablewebdesign.org is if you don't want to read a 300 page document, it's tagged, it's searchable. Uh, there are categories you can kind of find your own learning journey or your own path through those. Um, so again, uh, uh, I, I, I shared the link to join the community group. Please consider doing so. And I will stop sharing now so that Ann and Thorsten can take us home. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim, for the context of the creation of, the, of these guidelines. Now let's get into uh, very practical examples. I hope that you see my screen. Um, here and now with uh, Thorsten, we're going to illustrate the UX part of uh, some of the uh, WSG's guidelines, not all of them. We try to choose um, ones which we could illustrate with very concrete examples and uh, also which can cover different steps of, um, of a design journey of a digital uh, product. So let's start. Uh, there's a few guidelines, uh, and maybe the first one, the most important one is ask yourself, should I digitize? Uh, because the best pollution is the one we don't create. So this uh, is always a good uh, reminder. Here is an example of uh, what you can see in the Parisian subway. So we used to have these very simple uh, light bulbs, and nowadays they're trying to um, tend to replace them more and more with screens. Uh, which are much less resilient, uh, which have a, a massive impact on the, on the environment because the, uh, the, the manufacturing uh, of the screens and the devices uh, is about uh, between uh, 50 and 80% of the environmental impact, depending on the indicator you're looking at. Uh, of the whole digital industry. So that's why we should uh, avoid as much as possible to put screens when we don't need them. Then another idea uh, for the first steps 
of your project might be to set an environmental budget for your website, if it's a website, for example. So the same way you have a, a budget, a financial budget, and you cannot do a, an endless uh, project, you might want to have um, to set a, a maximum of what you want to wait uh, as a as a website. So there is a, a great uh, free tool uh, called Performance Budget Calculator. And the way it works is that you choose the kind of connection you want your service to work with. So for example, I tend to choose a slow 3G uh, mobile uh, network. And then you choose the number uh, in how many seconds must your um, page load. So usually it's, uh, what I like about this it's uh, is that it, um, it boils down to a UX, uh, to user experience, or just having a good user experience and being inclusive also for people who have all the devices, poor uh, connection, who live in remote places. And then what happens is that just by looking at these two factors, they can tell you how much um, kilo uh, bytes might your page weight at the maximum. And so it's a good indicator to uh, to set a, a limit for how much content you want to put in your page. So it's still accessible to many people. Another one is to make negative impacts visible. I'm going to let uh, Thorsten talk about this one. Yeah, it's, uh, you have heard a little bit about this um, in my intro and Tim mentioned it as well. So we need in the first place to make the negative impacts of the products that we build visible because in, in all the tools that we use, the standard tools, they all focus on the user, but they do not take into account all the other actors that are surrounded by the stuff that we build. And other actors can be, well, it can be other humans like the delivery rider for the um for the food, but it can be also non-human actors like you can see here, uh, like nature or like animals or like a river. And that might sound a little bit funny. And well, it, these, these techniques are around for quite some time. And over the past years, it was always a little bit difficult to, to talk about these things because people will always start laughing and saying, yeah, ha, 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 why do I need a user persona for a bee? Right. <laughs> But the good thing is, and maybe you can switch to the next slide, Anne, um, that changed uh, this, uh, I think it was September, right? When Apple at their big keynote introduced their mother nature spot. And there are many things wrong about these spot, right? There is a lot of, well, they talk only about the good things they do. They did not talk about the bad things and that iPhones are still not easy repairable. They do not did not talk about the working conditions in the factories in China, et cetera, et cetera. But still, they introduced non-human personas to the masses when they when they introduced this spot. And this helps people like us a lot because now we can go somewhere and say, hey, we should also create personas for the impacted actors, actually, that surround our stuff. And when people ask, yeah, but why should we do this? Then we say, yeah, well, have you looked at Apple? They do this as well. And Apple is the most valuable or one of the most valuable companies uh, in the world, maybe it's a good idea. So it really helps in the narrative and it helps us to convince stakeholders to use these things. And I can highly recommend to try in the very beginning of our design processes to give these things room, to create an understanding about the negative impacts of the products we build. And this is one technique, there are many others. And if you wanna know more about this, you can ask Anne and me um, um, afterwards, but this is a very simple and easy example you can start using right tomorrow. And with this, we come to the next point. Um, maybe just on this one, I wanted to add that uh, there's a great tool uh, which is free and available online called the Tarot Cards of Tech, which was developed by Artifact in England. And it's a list of questions you might ask yourself at the beginning of your project. And one of the cards is actually called Mother Nature. And one of the questions I love is, if uh, your user um, or your target was nature, what would you do differently with your product? And have tons of other great questions which might help you think in the ideation phase on how you can make your digital product better. But now let's boil down to the creating fictionless user journeys, which you already know as uh, UX, UI designers uh, is very important. Why is it so also in the, in the, in the, the eco design phase. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot, I realized I forgot to translate these slides. 
Uh, so it's in French, but here you can see the user journey of a French person trying to look for information about taxes in France. Um, so here the use case was the um, understanding the um, how much uh, money you could get back from the government if you hire somebody to help you uh, watch your kids. And so at the beginning, we the user was uh, trying to find information and the search bar didn't work and there was hope that it would work, but then the results were very disappointing. The website would make you go back and forth. Um, then it, it would make you go back to the professional part of the website instead of the um, of the peop um, of the other parts uh, for single people. And then eventually the user would give up and just search on Google and find the information elsewhere. So the issue here, and what's really important to remember is that we're not just um, assessing the environmental impact of one page, because actually this website has very light pages, it's just text. So if you look at some uh, assessment measures like a uh, green IT uh, analysis, it would be uh, a great uh, grade. But the fact is because the, the user journey is so chaotic and here it is actually a failure at the end. Um, eventually, the, it's much, uh, it has a much bigger impact than if it had been just one page, which would have been much heavier. So sometimes it's better to have a kind of heavy page, medium heavy, uh, rather than having a long journey of a lot of very light pages. So uh, assessing the weight is important, but what's really important is to look at the journey and what is the impact of the overall journey and not just uh, of the an average of the websites. Maybe I can add a few more words about user journeys because since we use user journeys so much and it's a very well established tool, um, there's a very easy way again to make impacts visible by using the user, user journeys we create anyway. As you can see here, that's a template we use a lot and I use a lot with, with clients. You can easily add additional layers saying, for example, okay, which other actors are impacted by this step of the user journey? How much energy from which source is used for this step in the user journey? What other social impacts um, come in hand with this step in the user journey? So, and this is really important. Very often it's easier to use or to enhance a tool we use anyway, because it's much easier to explain that to, to other stakeholders than, than introducing a totally new tool. So whenever you can um, enhance the tools you use anyway, do it this way. And as I said, since we use user journeys so much, that's a pretty good tool to, at the first place, make impacts visible and also use it to create very... Um, small ideas how to make things better because that's also always a big problem right when we make impacts visible it looks like a, oh there's the huge mountain of the problem what shall we do and if you try to bring it here in the user journey you get it in such small chunks that you can can develop really pretty tailored ideas to fix one problem after the, uh, after the next right and so that's a very helpful tool um yeah, to make things visible and to create ideas how to make things better. And with this, back to Anne. Another obvious uh, guideline would be to answer the real need. But now we're going to illustrate it so you uh, you can see what it uh, implies. Here are two examples I collected um, about um, features which are unnecessary and which might uh, impact greatly the uh, environmental uh, uh, toll of the service. So on the first one, I'm sorry, again, here it's in French, it's my uh, my personal uh, screenshots. Uh, there was a Discord update, um, which enabled the users to put some uh, animated video backgrounds uh, in the in the calls, uh, which is uh, unnecessary because Discord is first and for all uh, a discussion um, app. And same way uh, Spotify now enabled with the Spotify Canvas feature, to add the uh, five second long videos uh, when you're listening to music. So of course we understand why they did that. It's about emotional design and uh, creating, um, enabling uh, personalization and customization and uh, reinforcing the link between the, uh, the artists and uh, all the community and uh, the people, the users. Um, however, 
when we when we tend to have a, a bigger and, and bigger and older uh, digital service, we tend to add features all the time, uh, especially when we are uh, working in uh, agile. And um, and this is always at the expense of something else. Maybe the app will be too heavy for many people. Probably it will have uh, some uh, environmental toll. So it's also a, a choice of uh, what is really necessary for the users and trying not to add uh, unnecessary features. Also, there's a, a question of uh, serving the right amount and quality. So for example, here it's the BBC uh, podcast app. And when you try to download the, an episode, uh, they ask you if you want the higher or the lower quality. And the weight is between it's 10 to 20 MOs. So it's, uh, much, it's twice as, a, as a heavy if you choose the higher quality, but for most people, especially if you're listening to um, uh, talk emissions, uh, then you don't need uh, the higher quality because you cannot even perceive the difference. So here, maybe what they could have done uh, regarding echo design is to have uh, put only one quality, so not let people choose, but maybe for the most advanced users uh, in the settings, they could have enabled them to choose a different quality like Spotify would do, for example, to optimize the bandwidth. So um, here it's a, it's a way of helping the users uh, choose best the, um, the settings. And it's also a, a link to a, a forthcoming uh, guideline, which is choose really well your default options. But Thorsten will talk a bit more about that later. Another very important uh, UX and UI um, uh, guideline is to design mobile first, which is also a guideline of accessibility, and of uh, performance, web performance in general. So when it comes to echo design, it's very important because it forces you to uh, go to what's really uh, essential and trying not to clutter too much the, um, the screens. So here, for example, it was the first uh, version of the echo design guide that we published uh, with uh, my association. And so at the beginning, it was a Google Doc, and then we put it uh, on the, on the, in HTML, CSS, and you can see what happens on the left. So first in on desktop, we were like, yes, it's a guide. So it's a bit long, but it's fine. And when we put it in mobile and it was terrible, we thought it was really uh, impossible to publish this. So that's why we, um, by uh, designing it mobile first, uh, we changed um, the whole uh, homepage uh, to add a, a summary and also uh, um, a table of contents. And then it's much better as well on desktop, of course. So that's why designing mobile first is also very important um, regarding uh, the environment because it forces you uh, to avoid adding any uh, unnecessary uh, plugins or uh, too much text. Thorsten. That brings us to the sustainable defaults and already mentioned and Here's an example. Um, well, we all order stuff in the internet, right? And so here in, in Hamburg, for example, where I live in Hamburg, Germany, the um, the parcel delivery guy that delivers to my to my street, it takes him the whole day to deliver to my street, and that street is maybe 300, 400 meters long, and to the to the parallel street, it takes him the whole day. It would take him, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes to throw all the parcels in the middle on a uh, and, and let the people drop uh, pick them up there. And so the thing is, for example, um, here in, in, in Germany or in Europe, uh, when you order at Amazon, for example, you can, but you have to actively do this, say, hey, I do not want to have it delivered to my home door, but to the next hub. And here in a big city like Hamburg, the next hub is, for me, it's in two minutes walking distance, right? So, and that's the much more sustainable option, actually, right? So, well, it's good because... The, the delivery guy does not need to to walk to every door and could not even do his his schedule they they never are able to to do the schedule for the day and it's also good for the environment less parcel delivery cars and and transporters driving around and so here is another example uh, from a shop from sweden called arquette.com so and what you can see here is the default option for delivery is always the the next pickup location and i have to actively opt out of this option and say, no, I want to have it delivered to my home door. And they go even one step further, they're one step further. But well, that's also uh, related to the to the parcel delivery company, which is here at DHL. You can see home delivery is even more, uh, and more expensive. It costs more money if I want to have it delivered to my home door. And that's what we mean with, hey, why don't we make the more sustainable options the default options? Instead of having the sustainable option, the the option there that I need to opt in actively. And this is something 
that directly relates to to what we do in UX, right? And and these are the options that we can we can easily change. And with this, back to you, Anne. What I love about this uh, parcel delivery example is that it also illustrates how you would uh, design if modern nature was your client. So for example, maybe you could let the people choose what dates they want to be delivered because it often happens to me, for example, that they tell me you're going to receive it in two days, but sometimes I'm not going to be home or maybe I want it's not urgent and I want to receive it in one, in like one week or 10 days. And maybe it would be uh, more rational for them to uh, gather the parcels and uh, then to uh, to drive less distance uh, because uh, if I could choose a different date further in time, maybe they could choose uh, some slower uh, means of transportation and it could be less uh, impacting for the environment. So that's also a way of how designing for uh, modern nature can um, give you new ideas about what you can add in, as features in your uh, service, um, which will uh, directly impact uh, both the environment and the users. Also, um, it, like eco-designing a service or making it sustainable and accessible doesn't have to be ugly, which is uh, something we often hear. So you can be really creative with the graphism. Of course, the accessibility and, and the other sustainable guidelines are gonna be uh, constraints to what you can do or cannot do, like the contrast or the sizes or the consistency, but it's gonna be really fun. Um, so here are two examples I really like. So the one on the left is a, a one uh, I did uh, with some colleagues, we had lots of fun designing for a museum, and uh, about it was a, about an exhibition on uh, Celtism, and um, and so there were lots of images, and there were um, and so we used lots of SVGs and colors to try to make a, a consistent uh, journey for the users, and you could um, navigate uh, in different ways, and uh, and it was fully responsive and accessible, and. Um, and we had lots of fun and all the pages are like 100% uh, of page speed and they're all uh, very light, like 700 uh, kilobytes uh, at the maximum, uh, despite all the images. So you can totally put pictures, that's totally fine as long as you optimize them really well and image, uh, we'll come back to that later, but uh, it's, it's really possible. And on the right, you have a, um, an example of a city in France called uh, Grenoble, and um, and they created the they published recently a website which is totally and fully accessible. Uh, it's also um, very very light, and as you can see, it looks very um, uh, nice uh, both uh, on the graphism level and also uh, as a in uh, regarding uh, the 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 user uh, friendliness and the user experience. It it's uh, it's very neat and uh, and concise. And so talking about pictures, uh, how you can you optimize the content? The pictures are still the first um, uh, reason why the web pages are so heavy at the moment. So on average, uh, according to HTTPS uh, archive, uh, an average web page is about 2.3 uh, megabytes and images are responsible uh, for about uh, for more than a third of this weight. So that's why even though you might know this, uh, it's very important to uh, to optimize your image as well. And usually people tend to resize them uh, and that's not necessarily enough. Here you can see that between the resized version and the optimized one, uh, so we put 80, 800 uh, pixels wide uh, pictures on the website and eventually they're just um, not even 50 kilo, kilobytes. So you can really make them very small and optimize without having a pixel seen uh, on your website if you optimize them well. I love using short pixel or tiny PNG um, as free tools available online to optimize the images very easily. And eventually you can put uh, many nice images on your website and that's totally fine. And same with the videos. So videos should be very sparingly used uh, and avoid uh, as much as possible. But for us, uh, being uh, about an exhibition, we had content from the scientists and interviews of artists and, uh, and content which had to be put uh, on the website. It was important content. So if you have to put videos on your website, uh, we chose to implement them using HTML5 instead of uh, using a, a YouTube plugin, for example, because they are very heavy. A YouTube plugin is like 2.4 uh, megabytes. So it's more than the average weight page um, page weight uh, of, uh, of the web. So you should uh, really um, try uh, using uh, alternative uh, methodologies, use lazy loading and display the weight so that people know uh, what, they, what impact they're gonna have uh, if they launch the video. 
And here is the same using uh, some uh, free websites uh, for optimization. Eventually, the video was just 30 megabytes heavy, but it will be still a very good quality. In general, avoid plugins. So not only the YouTube plugin, but also the Google map, which is one megabyte uh, heavy. Also all the social networks because they tend to uh, to uh, track the users. Uh, they tend to uh, uh, to have a lot of uh, requests also, which are gonna impact uh, negatively your website. So instead of that, use icons with links, use uh, SVG maps, use maybe uh, filters for people to find geographically uh, results. Uh, but really think about what's necessary for your user. Usually a Google map is not the best way of displaying the information. And finally, um, I think it's the final one, you should test uh, what you developed. So test on all devices. On the left, it's the picture of my uh, smartphone uh, or the same uh, model, so it's seven years old. And uh, so I cannot use a Slack anymore because Slack decided that my phone was too old. Uh, so I should buy a new one because I don't want uh, to uh, to develop for my smartphone anymore, but it still works really well and it's still powerful. And so uh, it pisses me off that I need, should need to buy a, a new device. So make sure that your website and your apps uh, really work on devices older than five years or maybe older than seven years if possible. Uh, and then also try on low internet. You can simulate it online with your browser. So try, for example, regular 3G and compare with your uh, performance budget calculator uh, goal to see uh, if you manage to reach it. And now I'm going to stop presenting and the hand to Thorsten. Yeah, I'm taking over for the for the last part and this is well this is a question we all get get a lot right and i well i i speak at a lot of conferences and do a lot of workshops and very often this question shows up right yeah come on torsten good points all all right but it's not a business case even if i want to do it how do i convince the business people the management people and well the truth is this is not true it is already also a business case and just two very short examples um, this is in use from the beginning of this year. So what it says in general is that HSBC, which is a bank, puts greenwashing to the risk metrics. So they 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 value companies, right? And see how how likely are they to be a success in the future or or not. And well, a company that does greenwashing has a much bigger uh, um, chance to be a failure in the future. And banks do not do this because they want to save the world. They do this because they, they look at it from the money side. And here is another more concrete example, Capgemini, which is a large consulting company. They did a research about sustainable product design in 2022. And so what they mainly say is, well, doing sustainable product design is not only good to reduce emissions, et cetera, et cetera. But it is also good, for example, to um, get benefits like increased revenue or um, to get an improved relationship with your customers or an improved relationship with your employees. And again, Capgemini is a consulting company. Again, it's about money for them. It's not because they want to save the world. And if these companies already say things like these, then you can believe that, um, that this is true. And this is a very important thing also when working in this whole field of digital sustainability. There are a lot of narratives out there that we need to change because they are not true anymore. And one very important narrative is that sustainability is just a cost factor. It's not. And I say very often to, to people and to clients, I say, hey, well, you could start doing these things now or otherwise you will be overtaken by the market and you won't have a business in five years anymore. And especially here, so I'm not a very expert about regulations in the US, but I can tell here in the EU, um, what was happening or what is happening with, with accessibility at the moment, right? So that in, in the EU, we have this legislation that says uh, digital products need to be accessible, need to, be full, need to fulfill accessibility standards. And the same things are happening with digital sustainability at the moment here in the EU. So the regulations will come. And that's another very good argument for the business people saying, hey, well, we have to take care of this anyway. And if we do, let's say the next web project now, why don't we take these into account right now? So very important also talking to people 
and doing it again and again to help changing these narratives, to, to, to work against these wrong narratives of sustainability is a cost factor because this is not true. So, well, to, to wrap this up a little bit, what, what, how can you start? And well, we, we could talk for another 30 minutes about this, but just three things, maybe also depending on where you are on your personal expert level in terms of sustainability. So how can you start tomorrow? Well, first thing is dive into these things, right? Have a look at the web sustainability guidelines. You do not need to learn about all of them at the same time. Pick one, two, or three that, that feel most familiar, that feel, okay, yeah, I think I can start working on this, right? And start with one or two, and that's fine. And then later on, you, you take the next ones, and then you speak with your... Um, with your um with your colleagues for example about this so and then on the next level start implementing them and and scaling them right spread the word talk to your team to other stakeholders put sustainability on the agenda and then try to set goals right the easiest one is at first to ask okay what's the what's the carbon impact of our digital product what's the carbon impact of our website and when you have this discussion you can say yeah how about we set a goal about lowering this carbon impact in the next six months or next 12 months well and if you say hey i'm now i'm an expert on this level already what can i do now yeah well contribute to the community as as tim said we have these these wonderful community group uh, or working group uh, that that worked on these on these guidelines and there are other great communities uh, out there as well and it's really important to to join forces actually to to join communities to work together and uh, to to make us all a bigger force altogether. And well, the, the most important question you should or could ask yourself when you're leaving the session here today is how sustainable is your digital product? How sustainable is the project you are working on? That's the first point, starting to ask this question. And I want to end the talk with a quote that I use it very lot. And it's also another personal mantra for me because, you know, sometimes, and that's what many people also say to me it's like yeah but i'm just a small designer i'm i'm maybe even i'm a junior designer what can i do i don't have any impact and i think i personally think that's not true and here's this nice quote by amanda gorman that's the young woman that spoke at the inauguration of uh, joe biden and she said for there is always light if only we are brave enough to see it if only we are brave enough to be it and i think that's the very important point we are still at the very beginning and you know I'm 45, uh, 45 now, yes. Um, I will do these things for the rest of my life. We will never reach a point where we say, okay, now we are done. I can lean back and everything is good. We have to do this until the end of our life. And we are still at the beginning. And we need people like all of us, like you that are here today, to, to be this light, to enlighten other people, to, to set examples, to start working on these things. And that everyone can do this, right? Doing a very little thing is always better better than, than doing nothing. And with this, I want to say thank you. And now we are open for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I've been collecting questions about a, a lot of activity here. Uh, we've only got seven minutes, but um, I don't want anyone's questions to be lost. So I've been copying them out into a document and hopefully we can do a uh, follow up um, with the recap email as well. I think. Tim, I think uh, Zoom creates a, a follow-up email um, uh, and then we'll work out some other way of contacting everybody but signed up, uh, GPDR allowing. Um, okay, so I think we've got time for a couple of these questions though. So let me just quickly put this in the share. Um, share screen. Hopefully you can see this. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to start with one I prepared earlier, just because it, it was a nice segue from one of Thorsten's closing points. Uh, we saw how WCAG ended up lining up very nicely with legislation around accessibility. Uh, initially, the law said one thing, WCAG said another. Gradually, the law started in most, in most jurisdictions to rely on WCAG and effectively WCAG 2.1 or 2.0, Double A is, is the de facto standard for most of these rules. Do you see anything like that happening in the near term with the WSG? 
I'm thinking particularly uh, since California passed their own uh, Carbon Accountancy Act and so on, that seems to include a nod towards digital. Um, it, 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 is, there, is, this, is there a legislative track that you're following in the WSG process to, to try and help lawmakers? I can answer that. Um, uh, actually, I don't know if I have an answer to that, but I can tell you what our plan is. Um, uh, the, 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 we would need to be on, in order to get you know, W3C's official backup, which is what would be needed in order for legislators to look at that and be like, yeah, that's a serious thing that we will take into consideration right now as a community group. We're kind of outside of the W3C ecosystem, even though we're part of it, you know, we don't have the membership spy in yet. So we need to go through a process of doing that, of which we're planning to do that in 2024. Um, with the idea being that we could release a first draft of a specification that's officially on the standards track at W3C, hopefully sometime next year, um, and or or maybe you know even into early early 2025, depending on you know how the red tape goes with with the W3C membership. Um, but the idea is definitely to uh, um, you know follow the same kind of path legislation wise. Um, providing some recommendations and and you know there are you are you did mention the the California law there's also CSRD in the EU um, that uh, is going to make climate disclosure climate reporting and you know uh, emissions disclosure mandatory for larger companies I do see a day when that's going to be mandatory for all organizations whether you're a nonprofit whether you're a, a, a small business that there's just going to be kind of processes that you go through to report your your environmental impacts and and stuff. Um, so I think there is a lot of opportunities there to use the WSGs to kind of drive that process. Um, yeah, and like I said, in order to do that, we will need some uh, larger, broader buy-in. Um, we are also, again, uh, aligning this with the Global Reporting Initiative. Um, uh, they're possibly aligning it maybe with the SDGs, as, as um, uh, Thorsten brought up earlier. Um, that's They're already aligned with those concepts. It's just a matter of getting very explicit documentation around how um and so like for instance with the sdgs are we can can we you know tag specific targets within an sdg um that aligns with a very specific uh, web sustainability guidelines and so you know because it is so early phase i don't know that there's a, a, a ton that we can do at this point other than to say you know use these as a resource and as you're thinking of as countries are thinking of legislation um they could be used to inform that or or at least uh, um you know generate questions to ask and, and I would like to add one sentence here, uh, at least in the EU with the, so I think we had much more speed than we have been with the accessibility guidelines, because right. in the EU, the, as I said, the new green deal, and there is these CSRD, CSRD corporate yeah. sustainability reporting directive. So the thing is at the moment with ESG reporting, it's companies talk a lot about scope one and maybe scope two emissions, not about scope three. A lot of the digital things fall in the scope three um, uh, part. And with the CSRD, companies also must report on these things. So that puts a lot of pressure on them, I think, actually, at least here in the EU. So legislation, legislation is already happening. And so therefore, I think we had much more speed here than we have seen with the accessibility guide. But that's my personal opinion from from the EU, at least. In France, we already had our first law on the reduction of the environmental footprint of the digital industry two years ago. And next year is being published uh, some guidelines equivalent to the one we have for accessibility. And, uh, and we can see already that in every public um, request for proposal, they have a uh, uh, they, are, they have demands on the environmental responsibility of the companies uh, answering so that we see the whole private sector um, really getting interest into that because of the public services uh, demanding uh, these requirements. Great stuff. Thank, thanks, everybody. Um, great. Uh, you know, carrot is nice. Stick works really well, as we saw with accessibility. <laughs> so, right. Uh, lots to look forward to there. Um, Okay, uh, another question uh, from one of our audience. Existing tools for estimating energy and emissions uh, can have very broad system boundaries. Are there any tools that estimate emissions more specifically? Um, and here, here, here a question saying like, around the impact of the U UX decisions we make. So, so maybe that's two things. Maybe that's more precise tools for estimating energy use of an existing service, and then other tools for estimating the impact of a decision that you are making at the design phase 
and I know we've only got like one minute and I've still got to do our thank yous. So this might be a, a big one. It is a, it is a big one. Um, I, I'll just quickly uh, share a link for those who are um, interested in this topic on the, around the sustainable web design model um, to, to go read this article uh, that really talks about how you can start to put more granular data into the system boundaries to get more uh, release or more, more accurate, accurate uh, emissions estimates. Um, Thorsten and Anne, I don't know if you have any specific tools in your UX arsenal that you use um, specifically to measure or reduce emissions uh, as part of the design phase. Well, I think I think there is no super. Well, also I see Anne nodding. Then you can go first. Thank <laughs> you. Um, I think we're going to say the same thing. There's no such thing as measuring the environmental impact of a digital service. The only way you can do it properly is by doing a full life cycle analysis, which takes months. So by the end you've done doing it, it will already be uh, out of date. So there's no way, everybody who sells you measure is a liar. There's no way of measuring it, but you can assess. You can make some assessments uh, and then there are a lot of free tools which help you assessing your progress. So that's the main goal is assessing so you can see how good you are doing compared to others and how good you are doing compared to yourself before. So that's the main goal of these um, quantitative assessments. Uh, regarding the specific UX decisions, sadly, we cannot see the future of how it can impact. However, we have uh, we tend, we, nowadays we have a few years of experimentations. There's a lot of uh, things to explore, but nowadays we know uh, what's um, uh, the least uh, impactful for the environment. For example, between two different solutions, between static pages and dynamic ones, between a, a slideshow and putting static images. So we, we tend to know what's uh, lighter and what's best regarding UX decisions. Uh, if you look at uh, other um, uh, feedbacks from people who experiment uh, it, but it's not going to be a, a specific quantitative measures regarding your products. Uh, sadly, uh, this doesn't exist at the moment, and I, I don't think it will ever exist because uh, yeah, digital tools are so complex. That's the thing. It's complex. And what I want to add, this example of the sustainable user journey is a, also a pretty good tool to get as close as you can to these things, right? Because again, it's always about breaking it down to small chunks and doing it with user journey gives you the, the the opportunity to estimate for each step okay what emissions come from this but it's still work to get to get the answer to these right because there is no tool where you can just enter your data and then bling it's there that's the that's the hard answer i just did the equivalent of playing us all off here like they do at the oscars uh since we're at our time and slightly over i wanted to make sure that i left enough time here to thank uh, all our panelists, Anne, Tim, Thorsten, um, you can catch all of these fine fine folks uh, in their respected uh, respective areas. So obviously the W three community there, Susty Web, um, that's always open and looking for contributors. So that's like the main place to learn and the main place to contribute is to go there. You can catch Tim in Chicago. Uh, you can catch Anne and Thorsten online um, at their respective websites. Thorsten's launching a, a, a new course. Uh, we'll share a sign up link for that after, after the session. You can follow me at my newsletter on sustainableux.com and Anne at designersethics.org. Um, so just to thank everybody uh, involved today. Thank you, audience, for coming along. Uh, I hope this was useful. Um, obviously, there's, you know, this is one hour and there's... 200,000 guidelines or something. I, I think I heard there, Tim, um, uh, to, to learn. Um, it's all good stuff, but it, it is a lot of un to unpack and we'll be, we're going to be learning about this for months and years to come. Um, I'm going to stay online for a minute just to make sure I've copied down all the all the Q&As. You, you all submitted fantastic questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to answer all of them. Um, I am going to collate them and uh, uh, do my best to to get find some answers. Um, and put that out in an email. So you'll see that on my newsletter. Um, and if we figure out how to send an email through the Zoom platform, uh, we'll see it on there as well. Thanks again, everybody. And Thank Tim, you Thorsten, much. you didn't get, the audience don't have the reaction button, so they can't do the round of applause. <laughs> so I, I have to do that um, instead. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you, everyone. you very much. Some great stuff. Thank you all. Take care now. <laughs>